Chuck's a retired software designer and lives with his wife, Suzanne, who is here, on a small farm in Jackson County. He's been an avid photographer since his late teens, specializing in birds, bugs, and blooms. He's made photos on all seven continents, which I think is really impressive, and he's taught photography courses for Ali at UGA, UGA Continuing Education, and the State Botanical Garden, and other venues around town. His photos have been featured in local publications and leading national photo magazines, as well as the current National Wildlife Federation calendar, which I can't wait, that's for 2018? Uh, the current one, 2017. I'm, uh, and this year's National Wildlife Federation holiday cards, that was the one that was new. The Linden House Art Center, the State Botanical Garden, and the Georgian Museum of Art have exhibited his photos. He doesn't sell his work. You can't buy it. Well, you can buy it, actually. Well, we'll talk more about that. But in general, he doesn't sell his work. It's all for fun, and he claims to enjoy photography as much now as when he was a kid. That's why his website is, and I always wondered about this. I learned it from you writing this. His website is boywithcamera.com. So that's easy to remember. So uh, I met Chuck here at APG about the first time, maybe two and a half, three years ago. And right away, Chuck offered to lend me some equipment. And it was, the, uh, it was a monitor calibration thing. No, that was from Wade. You, off you, offered, <laughs> you offered, Wade. Wade's great, too. <laughs> we look a lot alike, a lot of good <laughs> That's true. But um, so Chuck and I met. I did buy one of his, his used camera, which is a camera I use predominantly now, the, his, Mark, three. his Mark III. He sold to me about a year and a half ago. Then, um, and this was about a year and a half ago, I get this email from Chuck. Hey, want to do a show together, MYN style, which is this on white? And I'm like, OK, sure. How hard could that be? <laughs> Little did I know the journey I was in for. We have worked so hard. As you all know, you know what it's like to, to take a lot of photographs, edit them, polish them, and then actually show them to people, to the public. It's a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. And Chuck has been great. He's been generous. He's been patient. He's more experienced than I am. He shared so much information with me. And it's been a wonderful year and a half working together. And we have one more week. We have not had an argument yet. We're going to hang our show on Wednesday. And hopefully, we'll, we'll get to the finish line without punching each other. So with that, generous and nice Chuck Murphy. So my wife, Suzanne, in the front corner, did, did that pass the fact checking? Any, any fake news, mostly? OK. So I'm introducing Janae uh, with her bio. Janae's an entomologist with a master's degree. Do I need the mic? Probably better. Probably. Check. Does that work? Do I need to start over? No. <laughs> She's worked for over 30 years in insect research laboratories at University of Florida, Clemson, University of Wisconsin, and for the last 15 years at UGA. Most of the time, she's been privileged to work with her husband, Michael Strand, who is both a famous professor and a worldwide famous <laughs> entomology bug person. I, I did. <laughs> I looked him up. He's famous. She's been fascinated by bugs since childhood and is passionate about sharing the beauty of insects with others. This could be quite a challenge, since many people seem to find insects repulsive or scary. Photography has proven to be the best means with which to show others how amazing insects are with their hairs, shiny exoskeletons, and furry scales. Her photography interests blo really blossomed in 2009, when after a health scare, she decided to finally invest in digital equipment. She's not willing to reveal how much she has invested, but has not regretted a penny spent on cameras, lenses, or photography excursions. And I guess the only tidbit to add to that, she told me some time ago, uh, self-proclaimed bug nerd since the age of seven or something like that. She knew what she wanted to be before she grew up, and I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh, you've had a number of experienced speakers at these meetings, people with a lot of years of photography experience. Um, I, add, I did the math. This evening, your speakers have a cumulative 86 years of photography experience. What? So I'm watching for people to whip out their calculators and start. <laughs> <laughs> M most of that is mine, because I started way, way, way back. 
Okay, um, I think we're good to go unless I think of something else. Okay, so I'm up first. So I'm gonna click through this. Um, in case you've been off the planet and haven't heard, Janae and I have an exhibit at the photo, at the Bod Garden. <laughs> at uh, op opening reception is a week from Sunday. First off, um, I gotta thank a bunch of people. The virtually every sh photo that I'm showing here tonight was shot with flash. And through all about the last year of my photography experience, I was a guy who hated flash. Um, pe people who did flash were for, it was people who didn't know how to work with available light. I hated it. It was like work because it involved in math and I retired 10 years ago and I gave up math at that point. It seemed like a lot of arithmetic and uh, I, I looked at pictures and said, ah, oh, flash, nobody knew how to work with available light. But when was it? It was last year sometime when Wade and Tim did a session on flash photography and that was eye opening. Specific specifically, Wade introduced me to this book Speed Letters Handbook, which is targeted at Canon photographers. But I bought it, I read a lot of it, and said, gee, if Wade could do it, maybe I can figure this stuff out too. So now, virtually, I think, with one exception, all of the photos that I have in the show on the wall are flash. And that is now my starting point. I have come to love it, and I just couldn't do the stuff that I'm doing without it, so I'm a convert. Um, let's see. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. The beginning of this, um, yeah, I think we've known each other for three years, but I, just before I came over this evening, I looked back, and the very first mention, all the way back to the beginning of the email thread, June 8th, 2016, there was an email from you saying it came, you mentioned Clay Bolt, whose name will be coming up in the presentation, said, Janae and I should get together because we both lived in Athens and did Meet Your Neighbor style photography, and we should have an exhibit. And the one other foot that I would say, you think, oh, a photography exhibit, I'll just take a bunch of pictures. Janae and I agreed that the time you spend behind the viewfinder adds up to approximately 2% of the time that you will invest in putting on a show like this. So um, thanks to Tim and Wade for doing that. The other thing I want to do is thank people. I, I, I was a um, APG participant a while. I was a program chair for a while. And having done that, I just wanna let everybody who's not a board member know that you have no idea how many hours these people put in to keep this group going. So I, I would just like this room to say thank you to Judy and Tim and Wade and Angie. I will repeat, you have no clue how many hours it takes to keep this thing alive so that you can be here and learn about photography stuff. Okay. What else we got? I can't see what I'm doing up here. Okay, so we've done bios, we've done bios. Meet your neighbor's exhibit at the Bot Garden. Those dates, reception there, hope to see you then. Um, okay, where did this meet your neighbor stuff start? Um, the idea being uncluttered background. This is the first time I became conscious of this style. Um, having been doing this for a long, long time, back when I was a kid or whatever, um, I started hearing about this fashion photographer, a guy named Richard Avedon. How many of you have heard of him? If you're, you're probably about my age, you've probably heard of him way back. Active in the 50s, 60s, 70s doing fashion photography and it was radical. Before Avedon started shooting, this is what fashion photography looked like. Okay, you've seen that kind of stuff before, you still see it now. He did something different. So he went with this kind of style, basically invented this, kind of different, right? No background, clean, uncluttered background, totally allows you to focus on the model and the clothing, which is the point of the whole thing not the Ferris wheel in the background. More of that kind of stuff. So he said, I did not invent this, but in my world, he's the guy who made it famous and the first time I became conscious of this. And he's sort of been in the back of my mind all the time I've been doing this meet your neighbor stuff. Um, other people more recently, there's this woman who's Susan Middleton who is still active doing this kind of nature photography. And I first bumped into her, I was touring the um, Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, Florida, and she had an exhibit on the wall and I was late for my next appointment. I was supposed to be somewhere, but I was just totally blown away by the stuff that she had on the wall, shooting this kind of stuff. She's published a number of books, but stuff like this, she does primarily marine photography. That's a crummy reproduction of a, I don't know what that creature is, I've lost the name. Yeah, and this kind of guy. 
That is stuff, you know, if you're the world's best scuba diver and the best camera and the best underwater housing, you can't make pictures like that. Um, but here's the kind of setup that she's working with, which as you'll see tonight is real similar to what Janae and I are doing with a camera light in front, shooting through water against a white transparent background to produce photos like this. The same way that Janae and I have collaborated on this, Susan Middleton has a collaborator, a guy named David Leachfager, and you're seeing him there with his camera and a tank with a fish in the background. And he again shoots a lot of marine stuff like this, a mantid shrimp, again a crummy reproduction, but that's a fairly good shot. The detail on the jellyfish is just not anything anybody's going to be able to get out in the ocean. So it's a way of bringing attention to the species itself and showing things that you could not if you were shooting out in the wild. That's a nice piece of gear. <clears throat> um, I <laughs> Like Janae, I've got a significant investment in camera equipment. This guy apparently has an infinite budget and, and maybe gets a piece of the action for all the money that he spends for whomever he's shooting for, because that's pricey gear. So he's got a Canon camera there. Um, the lens on that is the same beast that Janae uses. That's the Canon MP65, which is the macro lens that gets you down to a, not a macro is one to one. That thing goes five to one. So that can fill the frame with something the size of a housefly as you'll see from some of Janae's photos. It is, I rented one, it's a beast to work with, it's not fun, and I do this for fun, so I didn't buy one. But um, he's got a fancy tripod, that's the lens, fixed focus, not manual focus, fixed focus. That means you're moving your camera in and out a fraction of a millimeter of time to get the subject in process, in focus, which is why he's got a uh, geared column on that. Subject is in this sandwich here, lights below and above, um, to produce the kind of stuff that he does. If you've been watching PBS recently, there's been a, he had three segment show on PBS recently. Joel Sartori is a pro photographer for National Geographic and had a show called Rare, talking about his photo arc project. And he takes pictures of creatures like my cousin, um, this three-toed sloth against a white background, again, charming, because he's looking straight at you. It's kind of an engaging photo. Instead of a profile of a sloth, you're looking head on at that sloth and it makes for a more interesting photo. And these teensy, this is the world's fallest, try it again, smallest fox, whose name I forget, but obviously they hunt by sound instead of by sight. And here is Joel at work, shooting sort of the same way that Janae and I do. Camera up close, flash transmitter, pocket wizard on the camera to trigger flashes that are up out of sight, out of the frame. White background and looking straight on at face to face with the subject matter. And I sure hope he's got a crocodile wrangler to work with him to keep that critter under control. But that's, you know, this is familiar. Yes, same sort of thing that, that we're doing. Blow out the background to get the focus on the critter. This guy, uh, he's got one name. Platon, there was a show on PBS a while back. Part, there was a six-part series called Design, um, talking about top people in various niches just dealing with design. Furniture, architecture, fabric, illustration, whatnot. This guy was the photographer featured. Very high-end photographer based in New York City. You can see the kind of work he does. There is no background. These people are not shown in context. But to me, they're pretty revealing portraits you're getting a feel for the character of these three guys. The one in the middle, Edward Snowden, um, that picture was on the cover of Wired magazine. It was the feature article. They flew Platon over to Moscow for a secret interview and photo session in order to get that picture on the cover. Um, so <laughs> I think the guy does interesting work, but again, they're not shown at their desk or smiling walking down a corridor. He's removed the background to get you focused on what's happening. Okay, this Meet Your Neighbors project. I mentioned the name Clay Bolt before. Um, I am a Clay Bolt groupie, self-proclaimed Clay Bolt groupie. I've met him, I've been to two workshops with him and met him another time. And uh, he is one of the co-founders of this Meet Your Neighbor project. He is high profile. What do we got? So published in National, Ge all everywhere. National Geographic, Audemars Magazine, Smithsonian, National Wildlife Federation, several articles frequently in National Wildlife. Ultra Photographer Magazine. He's a founding member of International League of Conservation Photographers. 
He's the press president. He just ended his term as president of the North American Nature Photography Association, and he now works for World Wildlife Fund in the Bozeman, Montana office. And his partner in the founding is a Scotsman, hence the name of the project with the British spelling, uh, Neil Benvee, published in a lot of places, and um, he makes his living guiding tours with his wife around Europe, Iceland, and various other places, not all over the world, but makes a decent living doing that kind of stuff. So they founded this. Background about the project. Um, International Biodiversity Awareness, founded 2009. 70 plus photographers, Janae and I are two of those. We're, we represent Georgia. Motto, biodiversity begins at home. I'm gonna contrast that in a minute. Goal, dedicated to reconnecting people with the wildlife on their own doorsteps. So, you understand the, the thing about um, Joel Sartori. Sort of the same idea, biodiversity awareness, but opposite in a lot of factors. So, um, Joel is one guy. Meet Your Neighbors is 70 plus people around the planet. Um, he is paid by National Geographic to go to all the interesting places on the world and shoot endangered species, whereas Meet Your Neighbors is amateur shooting stuff in our own backyards. He's shooting endangered stuff and we shoot whatever we can find locally to, show, to share with everybody in the world. Um, and we're self-funded. I wish I, I wish National Geographic would send me to Mozambique, Madagascar, and all the rest of the cool places in the world, but not likely. So I shoot in my backyard and do what I can to make things interesting there. Um, websites, oops, back, wrong button. <laughs> okay, online, uh, the website is Meet Your Neighbors with a British spelling dot net, and the Facebook group is simply Meet Your Neighbors again with the British spelling. So the rules of the game, there's, a, there's an e-book uh, that sp spells out exactly the rules for doing this photography if you're going to be a niche, which Janae has printed out. It's an e-book that you can buy for, I forget, 10, Less than 10, dollars. 10 pounds, 10 euros or something like that. A lot of good tips on nature photography, but has all the rules and techniques for building the kind of stages that Janae and I have here for shooting small invertebrates and all the rest of the process. And the rules of the game are, you need to shoot it against a pure white background. It's not fair to just shoot something out in the wild and use Photoshop to take the background out. It's just never gonna look right. You can't do it right. So the goal is to have the background totally blown out at the time of exposure. My experience, I don't know about Janae, is I don't always get to do that. So there's some cleanup required afterwards, but the, the net effect is the same. Um, shadowless. There were some shadows on Susan Middleton's, but she's Susan Middleton. She can have shadows if she wants to. And um, return to the wild unharmed. No fair clipping a flower someplace, bringing it home, putting it in the studio, and then when you're through shooting it, putting it on the compost heap. The rules of the game, if you're following them, are it's gotta go back to the wild and continue to live out its natural born lifespan. So emphasis here I took this literally, backyard and all. So we've been working on this thing for close to 15 months, and one of the challenges I set to myself was, well, there's some interesting things in the backyard. I wonder if I could make an interesting thing. What's the most boring, prosaic thing that I could find in the backyard as a challenge to try and make something interesting? So my wife will verify this, but how many, what was the elapsed time? Three weeks, two months, something like that, working so try and get an interesting picture of a dandelion. So that's me, one day out in the garden. There is a dandelion there, you can't much see it. I've got the standard meet your neighbor setup. I've got three flashes, a white background. I'm shooting it in C2. I can't pluck that dandelion and take it into the studio to make it easier to work with. The dandelion has to live out its natural born lifetime. Um, and then my wife's suggestion, I had one picture having shot a few hundred, brought in and showed in the restroom of one of them, a bee happened to land on the dandelion. She said, oh, that's the only interesting one. It's got an insect on it. You should make dandelion pictures with bugs on them. So, you know, the, you know, the best, easiest bugs, you want something colorful, red draws the eye. So I ended up purchasing three bags of ladybugs, 2,500 per bag, at a trivial expense in the grand scheme of things here. And that is me trying to get ladybugs to stay on a dandelion long enough to take a picture. So, I, 
<laughs> I'm retired. I have <laughs> so um, I'm not showing the picture tonight. You'll have to come to the show if you want to see it. But I did print the dandelion. It's going to be up on the wall there, close to the center, and you can judge whether you got it. I will tell you in advance, uh, it, is, it is the best dandelion picture that I got. To me, it is nowhere near as interesting as the lady slipper organ that Janae shot with probably one-tenth of the effort. And <laughs> anyway, so um, it was just a personal challenge. And I'm looking, you know, I'll, I may continue looking for boring things to make interesting photos out of. So one of the concepts, uh, when we were putting this thing together, I was thinking one of the things that might make this interesting and contrast it and tell you what we're up to here is this concept of pictures taken versus pictures produced. Heather is sitting there. Um, Heather, everybody know Heather Lickletter Larkin and her fairyography photos? And, <laughs> and hairyography, okay, so we have somebody at least nationally, possibly internationally famous here. Heather's photos are produced. Heather does not go out with a camera and look for cute little girls to picture. She visualizes in advance what she's doing. So in that sense, it's sort of the same thing here. So what you're looking at on the screen <clears throat> is a picture taken. You don't have to raise your hand here, but how many of you have ever um, seen a butterfly and a flower, gone out with your camera and taken a picture? Okay, you <laughs> probably a few of you. Okay, I, I, and I have taken, I, I, I hadn't thought of this before, but there was one week, you, you know, you got, a, you got a picture counter on your camera that wraps at 10,000. Okay, once in one week, I wrapped the counter. <laughs> One camera, one week, over 10,000 butterfly pictures. Because it was, it was a, uh, a low-end camera with a slow uh, video viewfinder, and I couldn't really see what I was shooting. So I would just go out and point at the butterflies and hold the trigger down. And then, so wrapped it. Um, don't, I'm not recommending that, I'm just telling you. That was pictures taken. As opposed to, um, what I'm talking about here is one picture produced for the show. And this is my setup, my meet your neighbor setup for the butterfly photo that I got. So this is, um, you're gonna be, we'll be talking about the setup here, but this is fairly, this is the way most of my meet your neighbor's insect pictures and a lot of my bird pictures and other ones are taken as well. It's a three flash setup. So one camera up here with a diffuser on it. I'll try it again. One. Keep an eye on it, one flash. You are paying attention. <laughs> Flash over here with a diffuser, flash on the other side with a diffuser, and you can't see it here. I'm step aside for a sec. This is Janae's studio. This is my studio that I use for shooting bugs and spiders and critters like that. But the deal is it's a translucent panel there. And when I'm shooting things like this butterfly or a damselfly or something like that, there'll be a flash behind this shooting straight into the camera's lens. So that one, you can't see it, but you can see the tripod there, and the flash would be shooting behind there, straight into the butterfly. And then camera in front, macro lens, flash, wireless flash controller here, like Wade taught me about during the session here. And then, um, I'm still waiting on that what's that? I'm still waiting on that commission check. <laughs> I've thanked you seven times, Wade. <laughs> okay. And then one of the things that makes this feasible, if you've ever tried to chase a butterfly and put a camera up on its nose out in the garden, it's hard. They tend to not want to get a close-up portrait taken. Yeah. So backing, backing up on this process, step one is to plant parsley and dill. Let the mama butterfly find it, lay her eggs, find caterpillars, raise the caterpillars by continuing to feed them dill, fennel, or whatever, until the caterpillar forms the chrysalis, and you wait two weeks, and eventually the, the um, chrysalis, trans right, the butterfly pops out. From the time the butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, it takes 20, 40, sometimes up to 60 minutes before the butterfly <coughs> emerges and can pump up its wings hard enough to fly away. And in that 20, 40 minutes, you can pretty much pose her, put her wherever you want, and position her on the flower. So that's the process for doing this. You did that. You're seeing the photo, Rosemary. <laughs> okay. Are we get, getting the point about 
photos produced as opposed to taken. Um, so this, I think in the, yeah, this, was, this was a patient butterfly. I think I had about 40 minutes to work with this one before her wings got hard enough to fly away and, and she's released into the wild to go out and look for a husband and make more butterflies. But the ending out of that 160, I got the picture that I want. You remember the picture of Joel Sartori where the critter is staring into the camera? So one out of 160, I got this face-to-face -face stare down from um, the Georgia State butterfly, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, okay? Someday when you retire and have a lot of patience, you can, you may want to try this too. Chuck, are the wings white? Pardon me? No, the wings look white. Are they white no. or are they yellow? Uh, it's the projector. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, something, no. Uh, Pat's question was, are the wings white? No, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail has yellow wings. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, this is where Janae jumps in. How and, and why I make uh, photos in YN style, and my emphasis is on macro photography, insects, and I also love um, reptiles and amphibians as well. Unlike Chuck, I haven't, I don't think I've done a single mammal except my dog, and I've done no birds at all. So that Chuck owns all the, uh, in our show, uh, you'll see mammals and birds, those are all Chucks. But I do some snakes and salamanders and skinks, and then of course the insects. Okay, so first of all, um, MYN, Meet Your Neighbor, is one, it's a philosophy, it's a way of taking photos. This group, as much as I respect them and I love being a part of them, they don't own the style of photography. So you, if you don't want to be a MYN photographer, you can just say you're, you're doing shadowless photos. So for example, if I post something on the MYN website, and it was a beautiful moth and I didn't want to let it go so it could go back into nature. After all, I am an entomologist and we kill things and stick pins in them. <laughs> if I do that, then that's no longer an MYN photograph. It's a shadowless photograph, so an insect on a pure white background. Just so you know that you can photograph on a pure white background and not necessarily embrace all of the MYN philosophy. But I have to say, since I've been doing this, um, I have really enjoyed letting my insects go after I photograph them. It's been really gratifying, and I used to never do that. I'd, it always end up in the freezer and then on a pen in a collection I have in my living room. So it, it actually is, I'm, I'm really enjoying that part of letting them live. So, oops. They're excited about that too. And they're a lot happier too. Go back for a second. So what was it? I don't, okay, so the effect is stunning and it's, and it's uh, simple. Uh, you can do a lot with the shadowless images. Whether or not you like it, you can do things like this t-shirt. You can make composites. Uh, and the reason you can do that is you have a pure white background. So you can go in Photoshop and you can paste lots of photos together and everything's white so you, can, you don't have to go in and erase and have grays and off-whites and all these colors that uh, it's impossible really unless you have a pure white background or pure black or one color, but you know, pure white. Um, the key to doing that and to getting the pure white, especially in macro photography, is the backlighting. And not only is it pure white, but on subjects that are sort of see-through or translucent, you get a beautiful glow. Now, <laughs> um, for example, now let's see if I can do this. Um, these seashells, all of these seashells, Wade, I got on Sapelo Island on a walk on the beach. Any of them by themselves, you know, they're beautiful. They're beautiful things, but taken together as a composite to represent a walk on the beach. And, you know, this shell, for example, if I didn't shoot this backlit, you wouldn't see that, that glow. All of these shells, if you just shoot them, um, most of them anyway, the ones that, you, that the light comes through, like that one, the, the sand dollar, this shell, these. Having the light come through just gives a whole different look to the photograph. Uh, and then this is a composite, these are some composites. So with these pure white backgrounds, you can do some graphic art things like make the composites. Now, I don't need that anymore. All right, so here's my setup. This is, so that's why I do it, this is how I do it. This, I mostly work in my home studio. I, have, I live on a wooded property. I can just go right out the back door, collect things, and I bring them to my studio. 
I have um, four flashes. I got a little carried away with the flashes. So one here, one here, one behind the translucent plastic uh, background. And I, ha I have one on the floor as well, because sometimes if I want to do a dorsal shot from up above, I need the light coming that way. If I'm going a front shot, I need it coming. So I have four flashes. Uh, the sheets of translucent plastic. You can get this at either of these places. Google it. Uh, and I buy, you buy the sheets pre-cut, very cheap. So this is translucent. This is a flexible translucent plastic sheet that I have hung from the ceiling. Same thing. This is a flexible piece like Chuck has here that goes in the back. And so now the subject. The subject is a cicada. And I just happen to have him right here. He's not going to be MYN because he's dead. I did not kill him. He died of his own. Um, and he, so and this is really a key because you're, the subject is on a glass plate. Often you have to raise it up above the white background because all that light coming from below or behind will blow, will, there's too much light that will creep around the subject. So, so I have these risers, the glass plate or plexiglass, the subject, all the diffusion, and the light. Oh, and the bed net. So I used to shoot in my basement. It's unfinished basement, and there's rafters, and, uh, and the insects, you know, they fly away. So I, I got this tip from someone recently about just putting a bed net. So when the insects fly away, I can just go and capture them back re-photograph them or let them go. Chuck? Please? OK. Um, oops, nope, back one. Oh, and this is just a close-up. I forgot I had the close-up. Same thing. So the, the critter, glass plate, risers. This, this is another detail. Um, I, I did a copperhead about a month ago. And I've done some beetles that are very active. You, you want to make sure you contain it, especially if it's a poisonous snake. So having this barrier, when I put the copperhead, I also had something in front. So that if it decides to leave where it's supposed to be, you've got a little corral. So that's what you see there, barrier to contain the various live subjects. OK, now you can. How did I figure out how to do all this? It's really complicated. And I've seen people describe it. I've seen the work. But I've never, like, how do you do that? And then I stumbled on the fact that everything you need to know is in this wonderful ebook that you can buy. It's like less than $10. Um, if you just Google this fellow's name, who Chuck already mentioned, he's with the, the Meet Your Neighbors Project, Neal Benvi. He produced this. It's, once I had that in my hands, I was ready to go. And I knew what to do, except you know, with the hands-on experience, you, you work out a lot more. But it's just an amazing little cheap publication. So the field setup, you can put all this in a backpack. PVC pipe comes apart, you put it in a backpack, you go out in the field. OK, Chuck. OK. So what you want to do, this is on a Canon. I'm sorry, I don't know how to do it on an icon. But if you have an icon, you, you know what to do. You, of course, the holy trinity of camera settings for, for me, for a macro photographer, manual, raw, auto white balance. Then you enable highlight alert. And um, if you have a Canon, it's the blue tab, highlight alert, enable. And that's that annoying thing if you've ever used it uh, when you're shooting and it flashes. And you're like, how can I turn that off? Well, in this case, you want it, because that's going to tell you when you've blown out your background. And then, you know, depending on your lens, I usually start at a shutter speed of 160, and f-stop depends on the lens. OK. So blow out the background. I'm going to just see if this will work real quickly. And anyone who's interested afterward, I'll be glad to show you. So the first thing you do, you do not use the top lighting. You simply, and hopefully the flash didn't go to sleep, you simply focus on your subject. Did it go? It went, didn't it? That one did, OK. <laughs> Pretend like that went, OK? And then if you go back, because I did some earlier. Oh, turned it off. 
So I'm just going to show you what it looks like when you've done it right. Flashing black tells you you're blown out. That's what you're going for to get the backlighting correct. Okay, pure white, blown out background. That's really the key message here. Then you can move your top lighting, flash over, and adjust for that. And that's more straightforward because you're all more used to that. So that's the basic how to do it. And then you get something like this, and that's this exact subject right here. Blown out, pure white, can, can still see the wing venation coming through. Okay. And um, what can you do with pure white images? You can make composites. This is kind of sciencey, so maybe for a biology textbook or something, or it's an entomology textbook, dorsal, front, side, pure white. They all go together in Photoshop easily. And um, you can make a t-shirt like this, which I already promoted. With all, these are all chucks in my photographs, by the way. OK. Or you can do something fun with a spider and put a bunch of images together with a pure white background. I think that's it. Okay. And now back to Chuck. I take a lot of bird pictures, probably more birds than anything else in the world. And this is reflexes. Um, it, it's not something I have to think about. It's hardwired into my brain. See bird, reach for camera. See bird, reach for camera. See bird. Except for most of my lifetime, oh, it's a crow. Crows are boring black birds. There's nothing interesting in there. Nobody can, it's impossible to make an interesting photo of a crow. So there's a challenge, right? And actually, I snapped a few crow photos and said, ah, they're not black. If you, if you get the light right, and this, I, I will tell you in advance, this is my best crow photo. It's not perfect. So saying if you, if you get the light right, which hasn't happened, I, this was there. It's not the photo I want. But the head is really a nice dark charcoal gray, and the body feathers are different. It's a combination of iridescent blue, purple, and green. Like I said, this is the best one I got so far. Uh, when life resumes after the show, I may go back and try and get a good crow photo. So what does it take to get a Meet Your Neighbor style photo like this? Um, it's not grab camera, chase crows around the backyard, as you, as you probably suspect. So part one, um, this is a primitive version of my bird setup. My bird setup, um, I just grabbed one. So the prerequisite are stick for the bird to perch on. I got a very early version of my white backdrop there. And this is, you're only gonna do this first thing in the morning when the sun clears the horizon. That's the best light. And I want horizontal bright light. That thing is facing east, so the sun is hitting bright, right piece of cloth. Try it again, bright white piece of cloth to blow out the background. I'm not gonna get a eight foot sheet of translucent plastic and some searchlights behind it. I'm relying on the sun to blow out my background. Um, and then in the front of it, crow bait, cheap stew mate, cheap, cheapest meat that I can buy to put in front of there to bring the crows in. And yes, we went through, my wife and I are cringing, we're vegetarians, but we went through the equivalent of a cow and a half drawing in crows and vultures <laughs> to make the photos here. So the crows, there are no vegetarian crows. So <laughs> the other half of the setup um, takes a photographer behind it. So I'm working inside a bird, a blind, the same thing that deer hunters use in, in deer hunting season. Obviously I'd be inside the blind when I'm taking the photo with the um, big lens and a big camera on a tripod hiding inside there, waiting for the crows to show up. And of course, if you're doing this, you need the official meet your neighbor's bird photographer hat. And need to let the crows know that it's time for breakfast. <coughs> and that it's a matter of waiting a couple hours for the crow to show up and snap the photo. Patience, right? Yes. So um, this was fun. I, th I, th I think Janae may almost enjoy making setups as much as I do. It, it helps to be a handy person because there is practically nothing the same. This is my turtle setup. I think it's my third generation turtle setup. So I've got a series of ponds in the backyard, and the biggest pond has got four adult turtles. One of the turtles crawled out, and I was able to capture it. Otherwise, turtles are very skittish. And I wanted to get just a red-eared slider. The very, it's probably the most common turtle in Georgia, but I wanted to get a Meet Your Neighbor style photo. So this is what I ended up doing. This is the same, it's, it, those of you who take portrait photography, this is gonna be real similar. Those are portrait lighting stands. 
Tim and Wade and people who make portraits in studio probably have stuff like that. Uh, my backdrop is the sheet of the brightest, whitest, shiniest vinyl I could get at the fabric store, five feet wide by 10 feet long. And then I'm working in the garage. And what worked finally was to put the turtle on that piece of plastic, two flashes with diffusers in front with um, external battery packs to cut the recycle time from three seconds down to one second so I can go pop, pop, pop as the turtle, if and when the turtle moves. Camera is sitting on the ground with a short wide angle lens up close to the turtle so I can get an interesting perspective on them. Camera's got, again, it's got that wireless flash controller, wireless shutter release for the camera. And then because the, the, the turtle's not gonna stick his head out or move for 20 minutes after there's any motion in sight. So I am not a patient person. I'm yes, not gonna, <laughs> I'm, I am persistent, but not patient. Um, so what I do, um, I, I put a chair over in the far corner of the garage and I sit in the chair and I've got a book to read on my Kindle. It's gotta be a, on the Kindle. I can't have a paper book because if I flip a page on a paper book, that's gonna be 20 minutes before the turtle moves again. But if, I got, if I'm on the Kindle, I can just do a little flip and the turtle won't see it and I can keep going, right? So I'm sitting over there with the remote control, the, the shutter trigger in my lap. And after 15, 20, 25 minutes, the turtle's gonna stick his head out and start to crawl. Stick it out a little bit, look around, the coast is clear. He'll put his head out and run for the garage door. And in that time, I will crank off three, five quick shots of the turtle in action. Get up, retrieve the turtle, put him back on the backdrop. <laughs> 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 Sit down, pick up reading my book and wait for another 15, 20 minutes. But, I mean, it works. I got the picture I wanted, turtle with his neck out and a back background. Okay, does it help to be a little crazy when you're doing it? <laughs> so what else we got? Okay, hummingbirds. A number of people in the room shoot hummingbirds. Um, here, here's, here's, I wanted to get a hummingbird. Okay, how could I have, I'd be too embarrassed to have the show if I didn't have a hummingbird picture. So I really wanted to have the hummingbird. So I just did this on the deck, same white backdrop, sitting up on the deck. Deck is only, it's less than 20 feet wide, um, but it's, it's up there on the deck. <clears throat> this is where I started. There's just two flashes there and a stick by the hummingbird feeder for the bird to perch on. But you see the camera setups, a long lens, 600 millimeter lens with an extension tube to let me focus closer because I'm, I'm, I'm in less than the lens's closest focus distance. But this way I can focus down to um, close to 15 feet with an extension tube on it. And they're not, he doesn't care. If they're hungry, they're gonna come in there. He doesn't care if I'm standing 15 feet away, so I don't need to be in a blind. So this is, this is the thing that actually got the photo. Remember back at the beginning, I talked about available light. I used to shoot in available light. Now, to me, available light means every available flash I have to put on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> so I dragged out all, all four Canon flashes that I had, and they're all triggered by the, uh, the remote wireless trigger there, all at full power so that I can use the lowest ISO. ISO. So the, the, the exposure is simply all four flashes are full power, one to one. And then uh, practice to find out it's going to be, I'm going to be shooting the F-16 to try and get some depth of field because hummingbirds are pretty fast. I want to get maximum depth of field and still get a sharp picture. And then ISO just has to be adjusted to get the exposure that I need. So this is just for the bulbs, the flash? The, These four, or are you also using this camera? The, oh, the, that's basically all the light is coming from the flashes. There's a little bit of ambient light coming from the sun, but that's cranked in there. And I'm just going to be shooting at the, um, <clears throat> what am I at? I'm trying to remember shutter speed. It was over a thousandth, but then ISO to fit, so to freeze the bird in flight. Um, but I got, oh, I should mention, you've all been to the bot garden. And as you wander around, you see there are statues and sculptures and the rest of the stuff out there in the garden. And I, after I was at an event, recently had a lecture there in the big meeting room downstairs and had a little extra time so I went wandering around the garden to see what was happening to see if I might want to come back with a camera and I came around the corner I said oh there's a new statue here I hadn't seen that one before it's a statue of a lady sitting down 
And then I noticed in front of the lady is a tripod, on the tripod is a camera, and in front of the ca camera is a giant lens. And then I said, oh, it's Judy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a statue. <clears throat> now, I don't Our, cheat when I do my bird. <laughs> <laughs> I am not saying that one of these is better than the other. Some of us have the patience to sit looking at a flower, and some of us waste our time contriving arrangements like this to produce the photo <laughs> that we want. So it's, you know, it's personal preference. Um, Judy patiently sits in front of a flower with a finger on the trigger. And she couldn't wait for me to get out of her. So, oh so that it, yes, she's waiting. She's waiting half an hour for the hummingbird to show up, show up, and there's this guy distracting. Okay, so yeah, uh, personal choice. I'm not. I'm, I want to make that real clear. I'm not saying one of these is the right and the other's wrong. It's just different. So anyway, oh, one thing. What I learned after this didn't take that long. In the grand scheme of meet your neighbor's photo, this is one of the quickest things I did, but. The uh, hummingbird feeder, dish style, it's got three ports on it. Um, one of the things I figured out fairly rapidly is if you give a hummingbird feeder with three ports, what are you going to get? Bird, bird butts. <laughs> so just a little bit of painter's tape on the front two holes on the bird feeder, and then the bird has to feed from the port facing me and the camera, right? Which allows me to get one of the photos that I wanted. So um, it's not a picture Judy would ever take. She gets gorgeous butterfly photos her way, and, and I try and get one my way. I, I got, so this was only a couple hours to do this. This wasn't that bad at all compared to some of the other things I was shooting. Um, okay, that one was easy. This is one of the more elaborate setups I had to do. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Meet your neighbor stuff is daytime photos, white background. I've got critters, I use trail cameras at night. This is the thing hunters use, deer, cam uh, deer hunters and stuff, put these out by their feed plots to see what's coming through, which buck is at which feed plot, and the rest of that, so they can shoot them. I don't hunt deer, but I photograph critters. So I got several of these. Um, and I know I got possums, raccoons, skunks, foxes, and other stuff coming through, and I wanted some of those photos. It's not part of the Meet Your Neighbors thing, but I made up my own thing called Meet Your Night Neighbors. And I thought these guys would look at it better against a black background because they're nocturnal creatures. So I devised various setups to do this. Here's my setup to get the raccoon thing. It turned out the possum was easy. Possums are all over all the time, every place. You just put out possum food, which is again, hot dogs or the cheapest, smelliest dog food you can buy and you get possums easily. That was a piece of cake, but I wanted a raccoon and failed because every night put all the setup outside and the possums would come through and eat the food before the raccoon ever got there. So I had to make something fancier. Here's how, what it ended up doing. And this is what I've replicated up here just to demonstrate what's happening. Piece of, what are you laughing at, Jack? This possum proof. Possum proof raccoon setup. I should patent this. So what, what you're looking at here in the center is a log, this very log Got it? It is that log, which will have, um, not circus peanuts, but hot dogs embedded in it. The camera is over here, you can't make it out, but it's on this low tripod, and that's actually that, that same camera and that same tripod. I'm not gonna pick it up because it'll mess up my setup, but it's right there on the floor. Two flashes in front. If you're a studio photographer, it's the same thing we got here. Flash with diffuser up front, another flash with the diffuser up here, both of these pointing. At the end of the log, because the point of this is to lead the raccoon out to the end of the log, where, I don't know if I can pick this up without messing it up. <clears throat> this is what's, I'm gonna put my feet here so I can put this back, <clears throat> same spot. This gadget is called a Sabre. It's an infrared laser trigger that scientists and wildlife photographers use to set up a camera trap at nighttime, okay? Laser beam uh, triggers in some few thousandths of a second. It's a very narrow beam, but it's what you use if you want to shoot at nighttime without disturbing the animals. And I'm turning that on. It was not on before. And it's pointing in the wrong place. <laughs> but it does stop that. Okay, I'm coming around this way. So the way I raccooned proofed it was to use a chair and a table. 
So tab this is a table off the deck with a log sitting on top of it. And because possums are this big, but raccoons are this big, what I had to do was put a gap of about a foot between the chair and the table, and then bait it with hot dog pieces and dog food on the ground, hot dog pieces and uh, dog food on the chair, wedge some more bait into the back of the chair, a one foot gap over the table that a possum can't cross. With me? <laughs> so he comes over there and if, when he comes out to the tip of the log, it should trigger the laser trigger, which fires the camera and the three flashes. Oh, the third flash is firing from behind. Again, if you're doing a, a, a studio photography in a portrait, somebody's portrait, you want a kicker flash from behind to light up the hair, if you're somebody with hair, um, to get that nice rim lighting effect. So three flashes, uh, manually controlled, it's gotta be manual exposure, different exposures on all three flashes, and manual focus, obviously, because in pitch darkness, when the raccoon shows up at 2.30 in the morning, the camera's not gonna focus. So I have to pre-focus on the end of the log where I think the raccoon's eyes are gonna be. Everybody with me? Do you think this is gonna work? <laughs> Everybody got the setup? Okay, I had, so this, <clears throat> this setup is three cameras, my real camera and two trail cameras, one shooting stills and one shooting video. Uh, three cameras, seven tripods, three flashes, the wireless flash remote, the saber laser trigger, one can of dog food and three hot dogs. <laughs> and 40 rechargeable batteries. Okay, so, the camera was set up to make videos. You ready? Here. This, is the, this is the first frame of the video. That is a raccoon who smells dinner. Are we ready? Yeah. Raccoon marches over, smells the food, goes over to the chair, looks around, climbs up on the seat of the chair, looks around some more, over the back of the chair, onto the table, down, down, down to the end of the log, Gets three snapshots taken, goes back over the table, over to the chair, down to the seat, down to the ground, and wanders off. <laughs> Which produces, oh, that. Wow. Okay? So it's, you know, it's just a raccoon. But his nose is in focus, his eyes are in focus, the projector's kind of crummy. But I do have the rim lighting that I wanted. It would be kind of a more boring photo if it didn't have the third flash behind it. So, so the possum, I think I got, the, the first night when I did the possum setup, I think I actually got the possum. I'm sorry, the raccoon. The possum was going, it's like six weeks. You gotta do this when the weather's gonna be good. You can't do it if there's a forecast of rain. You set the whole thing up, th things fail. I mess up on a setting forgot to take the camera out of autofocus, whatever, get everything set up between nine and 10 o'clock. It's about a 40 minute process, best case, to get all the stuff set up. Go to bed, midnight, wake up, there's thunder, lightning, rain's hitting the window. I gotta jump out of bed, go in and bring all the stuff in. Because it's cameras are weatherproof, but not waterproof. But, um, got it. And in the process of this, my patient wife says things like, Gee, Chuck, can't you think of anything to make this more complicated? <laughs> she gives, she's, she's very patient and forgiving about this. Um, but even she gave me a hard time when I showed her, my wife gave me a hard time when I showed her my design for my new coffee maker. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's a lot of equipment. You gotta enjoy putting this stuff together. Where are we? So. The point is, okay, you get the idea, taking photos versus producing photos, making photos. So what is this about? I love nature photography, I think Janae does too. A lot of people in the room like nature photography. People like seeing photos, we enjoy taking them. Two different ways to do it. One is to show the context, show the critter or the flower or whatever out there in the wild, the bird on the stick, butterfly in a flower, the flower in the dirt or whatever. That's one way to share nature's beauty. It's not, like I said, not that one's right and the other's wrong, but, the meet your neighbor technique, it's an alternative style that lets, can delve deeper, reveal details not otherwise visible, like, this is one of Janae's. 
Um, to me, it's one of the coolest photos. This is a robber fly. This is the fighter jet of the insect world. These things catch other insects on the wing. They can pick a mosquito or a dragonfly out of the air. A dragonfly three times as big as they are. But if you look at the detail, you can't see it in this projector. But Janae's photo, you can see the hairs on the body, the hairs on the leg, and the rest of it, and the colors and saturation, the exposure on the thing is perfect. Incredible detail. This is one of the northern water snakes that uh, we could, my wife and I caught three in one week in the ponds that I have. They're out there eating goldfish and tadpoles and stuff, and I didn't really want them. So I caught one, rigged a snake, meet your neighbor setup, and got this photo that reveals the snake's beautiful colors. And I don't know how many other photos you'd ever see where you can tell that the northern water snake's got a two-tone tongue. That's in the show. An amazing photo by Janae. Uh, I've never seen one of these before. A wasp, this paper wasp that's all over your backyard, all four life stages there in one photo. You can see the egg there, larvae in these other cells, papered over pupae, all watched over by the adult here. And again, our projector is blowing this out, but the real print that's in the show, I think, this is in the show? Yeah. yeah. It's pretty amazing. I would never want to get that close, <laughs> camera or no camera, to reveal Wasp thing, but she's got one, show, one photo that shows all four stages. This is a little critter. Isn't it cute? <laughs> That's the uh, caterpillar of a spice bush swallowtail. We, uh, we planted a spice bush in the backyard three, four years ago, just for speci yeah, specifically for the purpose of attracting this cool butterfly, because the caterpillar um, makes believe that he's a snake to scare away predators. They only feed nighttime. Daytime, he wraps himself up in a leaf and stitches it closed. But I got this meet your neighbor photo showing what he looks like. Is he scary looking? Hard to believe that would really scare off. No, not to you. Okay. But he's, you know, I don't know how that would scare off a predator if they got bad eyes maybe, but he's all of an inch long. But again, meet your neighbor style. I can show that people wouldn't otherwise see it. If you grow blackberries in your yard, in your garden, and one day you've got blackberries with leaves, and the next morning you have blackberry bushes with no leaves, this is what's eating them. This is, um, my wife bought a blackberry bush, and she called me and said, hey, Chuck, there's no leaves on the blackberry bush. And I, I went down there and said, where'd they go? She said, right there, something's eating it. And I looked closer and closer, I couldn't see it, but she helped me pick it off, and I picked a, a I cheated. I picked a leaf off and, and put it on my studio and shot this thing. This is called a, I love the name. This is a unicorn prominent caterpillar and moth. It's got a close cousin called the false unicorn prominent. Um, but I just love the way it's camouflaged. If you see, I mean, that's part of the caterpillar, but it's the same color as the leaf and the same translucency. So light coming from behind, it just blends in and the rest of it's brown. So it looks like a dried up crumpled part of the leaf. And this whole thing, is the size of a grain of rice. But without macro lens and uh, meet your neighbor technique, you wouldn't know how cool a critter it is that devoured your blackberry bush. S millipedes, if you find one in your back bathroom, you're either gonna smush it or throw it outdoors immediately, but Janae contrived a way to make this cool photo of it. It's in the show, the print looks a lot better than that, but the colors and the saturation and the rest of that and the composition to me makes for a really cool um, depiction of a millipede. So that's our show. Opening reception a week from Sunday, two to four is the reception. We're at the Bot Garden. And for the first time, Okay, I didn't get there before and I'm seeing all these parents going through hoisting up their kids to show it, to see if they see a picture they like. We're having a kids exhibit. So besides adult level pictures, there's gonna be pictures 30 inches off the ground, knee height for you, but eye level for kids. So bring your kids, there's gonna be, they will be cute and fuzzy pictures. They're not gonna be snakes or centipedes in the kid exhibit, okay? But there will be pictures at their level. And okay, the other thing to note, if you do go, Besides pretty pictures, we, mostly the Janae part of we, put a lot of work into the arranging of the photos. You know, you go to a lot of exhibit, if there's 40 pictures, there's one, two, three, four, 38, 39, 40. Ours, we put a lot of thought into the way the thing looks like. So there's gonna be pictures high and low, left, right, up, down, whatever, and uh, we've tried to make the exhibit itself a work of art. 
back off after you've looked at the pictures or before, just go to the far side of the room and take a look and see what you think. Um, the end. I'm done.